Today, is the legal climate changing? Hello again, it's Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Welcome to this post covering finance and problem news with a distinctively Australian flavour. Well, we had three significant developments yesterday relating to the impact of business on the climate as the courts and Wall Street drive a change in the economic weather. First, a court in The Hague has ordered Royal Dutch Shell to cut its global carbon emissions by 45% by the end of 2030 compared to 2019 levels in a landmark case brought by Friends of the Earth and over 17,000 co-plaintiffs. The oil giant's sustainability policy was found to be insufficiently concrete by the Dutch court in an unprecedented ruling that will have wide implications for the energy industry and other polluting multinationals. The Anglo-Dutch company was told it had the duty of care and that the level of emission reductions of Shell and its suppliers and buyers should be brought into line with the Paris Climate Agreement. Judge Larissa Alwyn said Shell must at once reduce its CO2 output, adding that the ruling would have far-reaching consequences for the company and may curb the potential growth of the Shell Group. The interest served with the reduction obligations outweighs the Shell Group's commercial interests, she said. Roger Cox, lawyer for Friends of the Earth Netherlands, also known as Melda Defense, called on organisations across the world to pick up the gauntlet and take legal action to force multinationals to play their full part in tackling the climate emergency. He said, this is a turning point in history. This case is unique because it is the first time a judge has ordered a large polluting corporation to comply with the Paris Climate Agreement. This ruling may also have major consequences for other big polluters. Donald Poles, director of Milden Defense, described the decision as a monumental victory. Shell, which said it would appeal the judgment, was the ninth biggest polluter in the world in 1988 to 2015, according to the Carbon Majors database. An appeal against the ruling could last two years, but Cox said he hoped the company's executives and shareholders would act in the meantime. Shell had actually said in February that it would accelerate the transition of its business to net zero emissions, including targets to reduce the carbon intensity of energy products by 6 to 8% by 2023, 20% by 2030, 45% by 2035, and 100% by 2050. But lawyers for the plaintiffs successfully argued that the company had been aware for decades of the dangerous consequences of CO2 emissions and its targets remained insufficiently robust. It was claimed that Shell was breaching Article 6162 of the Dutch Civil Code and violating Articles 2 and 8 of the European Convention on Human Rights, the right to life and the right to family life, by causing a danger to others when alternative measures could be taken. The court ruled that there were indeed obligations both under Dutch law and the Convention, and that the company had known for a long time about the damage of carbon emissions. While the company had not acted unlawfully, the court said it had established that there would be an imminent violation of the reduction obligation. And he added that companies' policy intentions and ambitions for the Shell Group largely amount to rather intangible, undefined, and non binding plans for the long term. It found they were dependent on the pace at which global society moves towards the climate goals of the Paris Agreement, allowing it to move more slowly, and that the emissions reduction targets for 2030 are lacking completely. Shell had argued that there was no legal basis for the case and that governments alone are responsible for meeting Paris targets. The court found that since 2012 there had been broad international consensus about the need for non-state action because states cannot tackle the climate issue on their own. Shell's activities and products are responsible for about 1% of global emissions every year, but the company is investing billions more in oil and gas, the court heard. Bas Elkhart, a Green MP 
on the European Parliament's Environmental Committee said this ruling is really good news for the climate. It increases the pressure on large polluters and helps us in Europe to tighten climate policy for them as well. They can no longer escape the climate crisis. The international climate targets must also apply to them. A Shell spokesperson said urgent action is needed on climate change, which is why we've accelerated our efforts to become a net zero emissions energy company by 2050 in step with society with short-term targets to track our progress. We are investing billions of dollars in low carbon energy including electric vehicle charging, hydrogen, renewables and biofuels. We want to grow demand for these products and scale up our new energy businesses even more quickly. We will continue to focus on these efforts and fully expect to appeal today's disappointing court decision. And in the US one of the most expensive Wall Street shareholder battles on record could signal a big shift in how hedge funds and other investors view sustainability. ExxonMobil Corp has been fending off a so-called proxy fight from a hedge fund known as Engine No. 1, which blames the energy giant's poor performance in recent years on its failure to transition to a decarbonising world. In a May 26, 2021 vote, Exxon shareholders approved at least Two of the four board members, Engine No. 1, nominated, dealing a major blow to the oil company. The vote is ongoing and more of the hedge fund's nominees may also soon be appointed. While its focus has been on shareholder value, Engine No. 1 says it also was doing this to save the planet from the ravages of climate change. It's been pushing for a commitment from Exxon to carbon neutrality by 2050. As the business Sustainability scholars at the conversation wrote, we can't recall another time when an energy company's shareholder, particularly a hedge fund, has been so effective and forceful in showing how a company's failure to take on climate change has eroded shareholder value. That's why we believe this vote marks a turning point for investors who are well placed to nudge companies towards more sustainable business practices. Climate strategies aimed at saving the planet are an odd play for a hedge fund though. Such investment firms are better known for getting companies to stop investing in this type of thing so they can collect quick profits. Recent research undertaken by their team shows that activist hedge funds tend to target companies that spend more of their resources on those types of sustainability initiatives. That is, they buy shares in a company to gain influence and then convince other investors to join them in demanding efficiency enhancements and cost-cutting protocols to return more cash to shareholders. A follow-up study followed that companies cut spending on sustainable initiatives within five years of a hedge fund getting involved. In other words, hedge funds focus on short-term returns, not long-term concerns such as climate change or even a company's own future profitability. And this is because of how hedge funds fundamentally operate. Hedge funds usually charge their investors, often wealthy individuals and institutional investors, a 1% to 2% management fee in addition to a 20% cut of any gain in their investments. In return, these clients expect quick and substantial returns that substantially outperform the market. This is what makes Engine No. 1's fight so interesting. It began in early December 2020, shortly after tech investor Chris James launched Engine No. 1 with two other hedge fund industry veterans. The firm said it was purpose-built to create long-term value by harnessing the power of capitalism. Engine No. 1's first order of business was to pick a fight with one of the world's largest energy companies, ExxonMobil. It sent a letter to the company's board on December 7, 2020, urging it to focus on clean energy and shake up its board of directors, a bold move for an upstart investment firm with just a 0.02% stake in the nearly 250 billion US dollar company. But Exxon was an obvious target for this strategy. It has been a laggard on developing low carbon fuels for years and has prompted misinformation about the human impact on climate change for decades. After Exxon refused to commit to a transition to carbon neutrality, Engine No. 1 formally launched its proxy battle in March to force a change of strategy at the company, which it traces its history back to 1870 when John D. Rockefeller founded the Standard Oil Company. A proxy battle is when a group of shareholders tries to garner enough support from other investors in the form of votes to force a company to do what it wants, whether it's to cut costs or to change strategy. Exxon said it expected to spend $35 million more than its usual costs to deal with the proxy battle. 
Unfortunately, by increasing Exxon's expenses, these are costs that are actually footed by investors. Engine number one put expenses up $30 million, but the total cost, by some estimates, have exceeded $100 million. Engine number one was hoping to replace a third of the oil giant's board of directors with four individuals who have more clean energy experience. The hedge fund was also seeking corporate governance reforms, a review of Exxon's climate action plan and its impact on the company's finances, and greater public disclosure of its environmental and lobbying activities. Even before the vote, the campaign was already changing the way Exxon does business. In the past few months, Exxon has proposed a $100 billion carbon capture project in Houston and committed $3 billion to low emission technologies through a new venture. Though Exxon denies any of these investments were due to pressure from engine number one, it's hard to believe the hedge fund wasn't a catalyst. These are some of the biggest investments Exxon has proposed in sustainability in recent years, and they came right after pressure from the hedge fund, as well as the election of a new US president who has made fighting climate change a priority. Another likely reason for the new initiatives is that Engine Number no. One's campaign was enlisting significant support from other major Exxon investors, such as the California Public Employees Retirement System and the New York State Common Retirement Fund, which laid additional pressure on Exxon to do something about its lagging sustainability strategy. So, despite its pushback against Engine Number no. One and its proposed climate plan, clearly Exxon Mobil's attention to its sustainability plans have been peaked. So, why though? Is engine number one really doing this and do its motives matter? Well, the firm is pushing hard for some investment in sustainability and clean energy. The focus in its statements on what's driving this fight is mostly about shareholder value. And many of its demands, such as better long term capital allocation strategies, a plan to enhance shareholder value, and a misaligned management compensation, are straight out of a typical hedge fund's playbook. What we see as fundamentally different here is the emphasis the hedge fund is putting on the connection between sustainability and long term profits. It makes a strong case that the reason Exxon's financial position has been deteriorating is because of its failure to invest in low carbon technologies. Or like a hedge fund, Exxon has been focusing on the short term gains from fossil fuels at the expense of its long term future in the global economy that puts a premium on sustainability and a penalty on carbon intensive activities. Moreover, the readiness of so many major investors, including the three largest US pension funds and BlackRock, the world's biggest investment manager with $7.4 trillion in assets under management, in joining engine number one, shows which way the winds are blowing, which Exxon seems to now also realise. So the vote itself isn't the story here. It's that the weight of activist hedge funds, the most potent form of shareholder activism, seems to be shifting in favour of sustainability. And as we see it, this means companies and executives that don't invest in the transition low carbon energy will increasingly risk incurring their wrath. And now back to Australia, where a group of teenagers suing the federal government lost their bid to stop an approval to extend a New South Wales coal mine. But legal experts say the comments by the judge open up a big crack in the wall for future climate change based litigation. The federal court judge said approving the mine would have a small but foreseeable impact on climate change. The Australian Federal Court has ruled that Environment Minister Susan Lay has a legal duty not to cause harm to young people of Australia by exacerbating climate change when approving coal mining projects. The decision in the Federal Court in Melbourne on Thursday came following a case brought by a group of eight young people on behalf of, quote, all young Australians, filed in September last year. The group of eight young Australians argued duty of care existed and also applied to an injunction to be granted to stop the Minister from approving Whitehaven's extension to its Vickery coal mine in New South Wales on the basis that it would exacerbate climate change and cause serious harm to them in the future. Despite Justice Mordecai Bromberg agreeing the Minister had the duty of care to protect young people from climate change, that climate change would cause catastrophic and startling harm to young people, and that the mine would increase the chance of that harm, he dismissed the application for an injunction on technical grounds. But experts say the ruling 
could set up an important legal precedent. The decision is going to reverberate for a long time. Chris McGrath, an expert in climate litigation, said the judge ordered the two parties to make further submissions outlining how the newly determined duty of care impacted the minister's assessment of the mine. And the lawyers involved say the ruling is a global first. David Barnden from Equity Generation Lawyers, who represented the still children in the class action on behalf of all Australian young people, said it was still possible the court would stop the mine from going ahead. In his judgment, Justice Bromberg said approving the mine would have a small but foreseeable impact on climate change and that would increase the risk of catastrophic harm experienced by young people in the future. He said it was startling that more than one million of today's children would require acute care from heat stress at some point in their lives because of global warming. Dr McGrath said that the decision could have widespread ramifications not just for the Environment Minister, but for companies and other ministers. There's now a big crack in the wall, Dr McGrath said. The implications for litigations against companies in negligence law are there too. And he said that while the court did not grant an injunction as a remedy in this case, the door was open to claim damages for the impacts of climate change now that the duty of care had been established. I think this has blown open a duty of care for climate change in Australia. It's blown it open, he said. Whitehaven Cole welcomed the decision and said the application for the injunction had no merit. The company sees a continuing role for high-quality coal in contributing to global CO2 emissions reduction efforts while simultaneously supporting economic development in our near region, it said. There is strong market demand for the high-quality product of the type the Vickery Mine will produce. Dr McGrath said the case was likely to be appealed all the way to the High Court. It's a great decision to defend in an appeal, he said. He's gone through the facts of climate change, made some serious findings of fact. Findings on fact are not normally open to appeal, and in this case most of the facts were not contested by the Minister. A spokesman for the environmental minister said the government was considering the judgment and would have more to say in, in due course. And it's worth recalling that last year a 23-year-old Melbourne law student started action against the Australian government for failing to disclose the risk climate change poses to Australia's super and other safe investments. The world first case alleges that the government failed in its duty to disclose climate change's impact on the value of government bonds. The case was being led by a 23-year-old student, an investor who said she did it to protect her future. Experts say it could open up the floodgates for other litigations by tying climate change to real-world financial risk. The World First case filed in the federal court alleges the government, as well as two government officials, failed in a duty to disclose how climate change would impact the value of government bonds. Catter O'Donnell the head of litigant for the class action suit said she hoped the case would change the way Australia handled climate change. I'm suing the government because I'm 23 and I think I need to be aware of the risk to my money and to the whole of society and the Australian economy, Ms O'Donnell said. I think the government needs to stop keeping us in the dark so we can be aware of the risks that we're all faced with. Experts say it is the first where a national government has been sued for its lack of transparency on climate risks. Government bonds are considered the safest form of investment, with most Australians invested in them through compulsory superannuation. Bonds are similar to shares, but instead of investing in companies, the investor lends a government money to build infrastructure and fund critical services such as health, welfare and national security. Mr O'Donnell, who was invested in bonds independently from her super, said she did it to protect her future. However, bonds like shares can lose value if they become less attractive to the market. This can occur if investors question the government's ability to repay them due to rising government debt, ethical or reputational reasons. Ms O'Donnell said watching the impact of bushfires in Australia made her worry about the value of her bonds. Despite the government not disclosing climate-related risks to its investment products, Government regulators are increasingly forcing companies to disclose how climate change will impact their shareholders. 
the, this landmark trial has the potential to change the way superannuation funds invest retirement savings and pave the way for more climate change related litigation. APRA, the Australian financial industry regulator, said back in 2017 that climate change was not only a foreseeable risk but also material and actionable now. APRA is working with corporate regulator ASIC and the Reserve Bank of Australia to ensure public companies are examining climate risk, disclosing it to investors and acting on it. Ms O'Donnell's lawyer, David Barnden, from Equity Generation Lawyers, said the duty to be transparent extended to the government. We allege that the government is misleading and deceiving investors by not telling them about the risks, Mr Barnden said. We don't see any disclosure to investors about the risks that climate change pose to bonds and to society as a whole, so it certainly appears as though there is a double standard. Ms O'Donnell's case names the Commonwealth as well as the Secretary of the Department of Treasury and the Chief Executive of the Australian Office of Financial Management, both of whom are alleged to be responsible for promoting government bonds. The case is a class action, with Miss O'Donnell representing all investors and potential investors in government bonds traded on the Australian Securities Exchange. It does not seek damages, but instead a declaration that the government and those two officials breach their duty. It also seeks an injunction forcing the government to stop promoting bonds until it updates its disclosure information to include information about Australia's climate change risks. The case is backed by heavy-hitting Silk and former Federal Court Judge Ron Merkel and Barrister Thomas Wood, who was previously the counsel assisting the Solicitor General of the Commonwealth. A spokesman for the Australian Government Treasury said it did not comment on matters concerning current court proceedings. According to University of Melbourne Professor Jacqueline Peel, Australia is a hotspot for climate legislation. We have around 90 or so cases so far stretching back to the 1990s, Professor Peel, who has published extensively on the topic, said. Global warming is already changing the world before our eyes. Let's see what has happened in your lifetime. Only the US has more, but we've never seen a case like this brought before in Australia or indeed the world. It could potentially be very significant because it ties climate change to real-world financial risk, which might make those in the finance sector investors sit up and take notice. And she said it could have forced the government to take more action on climate change and spur on a new wave of climate litigation around the world by showing private sector cases had the potential to be brought against governments. This has the potential to be big news around the world, she said. Most super funds have a significant portion of the public's money invested with them with a fixed interest rate, but they are often also tradable and if demand drops it could lower the value of the bonds impacting investors, including super funds here. And former NAB chief economist Rob Henderson said Australians need to consider the impact of climate change. Australian government bonds are significantly more exposed to climate change than some other countries, Mr Henderson said. And Mr Henderson said Australian government bonds could be impacted by physical impacts of climate change like bushfires, which force governments to spend money or they could be impacted by reputational risk of climate change as investors around the world avoid bonds from polluting countries. Sweden's central bank has already divested from Western Australian government and Queensland government bonds because of climate change. And in November 2019, the deputy governor of the Swedish central bank, Martin Floden, said it was dumping those bonds, as well as bonds from the oil-rich Canadian province of Alberta. Australia and Canada are countries that are not known for good climate work, he said. Now, the move was described by former Liberal MP Bromwyn Bishop as a form of protectionism, but Mr Henderson said he was surprised a case like this had not been brought before. It's not clear to me why already the government is not putting those risks on the table and telling us what they're going to do about them, he said. So here you have some interesting tales which I think make three points. Firstly, there are significant market forces now driving corporates to behave more sensibly with regard to climate change. Secondly, the law is beginning to confirm that there are risks attached to climate change, which are risks that need to be taken seriously by corporates and governments because they have a duty of care. 
and third this is not the end of this this is just the very beginning because I think we're going to see a lot more of this ahead so like I said in the title the atmospherics around climate change are changing and the legal framework which is driving it is also changing this is going to be a very interesting set of developments which we will keep a track on ahead. I'm Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Many thanks for watching and I'll see you again next time.